I don't believe you, I told her. Yes, I do, she replied. I'll find proof. I'll do a DNA test. I've never been unfaithful to you, see, you know that. I didn't know that at all, but it didn't matter. I need to see that proof, I told her. That's what I thought you'd say. You're going to have to cooperate. I'm going to need a cheek swab. I would have done it a long time ago if you hadn't run away every time I tried to talk to you. I was beginning to lose hope of ever seeing you again. You were very good at hiding, Ripley. You left me, remember? I said. You weren't happy. That's what you told me. We got married too soon. You had your whole life ahead of you, and you wanted to explore it. That's what you said, and that's what you did. You tore my heart out. I loved you with everything I had, but that wasn't enough for you. You wanted more? I don't know what the hell you wanted. All I know is that you moved out, went on your merry way exploring or whatever. Fine, you had every right to do whatever you wanted. It's been three years. Why are you here? Don't talk nonsense to me, Kane. Did I divorce you? She asked. No, you just left me, I said. That's right, she said. You divorced me, not the other way around. As I spotted her, she occupied one of the high standing tables, indulging in hot wings. I was in the process of pushing my chair back to join the sparse single seating arrangement. The establishment mainly boasted four seater tables with only three single spots available. Among them, three standing tables stood out. She sat solo, initially escaping my notice as my gaze casually swept the room. Yet, upon a second look, she captivated me, stunning with her long, fiery red locks, clad in a form-fitting ensemble that accentuated her curves. An unwelcome interruption ensued as some hapless individual attempted to engage her in conversation, only to be rebuffed. She exuded beauty, but beneath the surface lurked a danger, a duplicity capable of shattering hearts. I was well aware, having spent five tumultuous years married to her, her name, Ripley. A prominent figure at a major radio station, I prayed she wouldn't recognize me. Opting for a pizza, the aroma emanating from the wood-fired pizza oven wafted enticingly. Accompanied by a serving of delectable hot wings and a dark beer, I settled in to watch a Razorbacks basketball game on the large screens. Yet, a sense of impending trouble nagged at me, and when I turned back, it materialized. Hey, see, she greeted, mind if I join you? Her voice, a familiar husky timbre, reminiscent of past intimacy, carried an undeniable allure, akin to fine whiskey, a Dominican cigar, and the croon of Nat King Cole. I prefer you didn't, Ripley, I replied coolly, intent on savoring my meal. It's been what, three years, she remarked, undeterred. How many attempts to reach out? How many times have I sought you out, tried to talk? Too many, I stated firmly. I have no interest in conversing, Ripley. Please, just let me be. If you insist on staying, I'll leave. They'll take care of the bill, I warned. She laughed, a sound that once held power over me, now only evoking a sense of melancholy. I'm okay with that, she said. I think my credit card can handle it. Me too, she probably made more money than I did. You're not stupid, you know I want nothing to do with you. What do you want, Ripley? I asked her. I want to talk to you, see how you're doing, tell you what I've been up to, ask how Kelly and Sam are doing, how Atlas is doing, and tell you a few things. What's that going to hurt? Am I so ugly that you can't stand the sight of me? Are you still that mad at me? Do you still hate me so much? Why? I asked. Why do you care about mom and dad or my dog? I'm not interested in what you do. We're not friends, Ripley. I'm sure you're not interested in my life, and I'm not bloody interested in listening to anything you have to say. Leave me alone, Ripley, or I'll tell the manager you're stalking me. She tilted her head to the side and raised one eyebrow in a gesture I knew well. She sighed. 
Okay, see, have it your way. I guess I'll just have to get the big guns. Don't move. She walked back to her table, and I watched her pull her cell phone out of her purse. She took her purse and went to the bathroom. I had no idea what the big guns were and had absolutely no interest in finding out. My pizza arrived, and I told the guy to put it in the box. I was leaving. I followed him to the counter, paid, and left. Jesus, another night wasted. I got home and put the pizza down by the pool. I turned on rubber sole and grabbed a few beers, throwing them in the cooler with ice. I was enjoying the pizza, leaning back in my lounge chair and listening to the Beatles when I heard the gate close. I have a wooden fence, and the gate has a spring on it so Atlas can't get out. I opened my eyes and groaned, it was her. What the hell was wrong with this woman? Of course, she knew where I lived, she'd been keeping tabs on it. And then I realized something, she wasn't alone. Behind her stood a small shadow. She had a mop of curly black hair about a foot long, fair skin like Ripley, very blue eyes, and she was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. She seemed very, very shy. She tried not to look at me directly, hiding behind Ripley. When Ripley stopped in front of me, a small shadow came around the other side of her and took her hand. Ripley knelt down beside me and gently led the little shadow forward so I could see her, her eyes were staring into the ground, and Ripley tilted her little chin up slowly with one finger so that our eyes met. Kane, meet McKenna, she said. McKenna, this is Kane. I didn't know what to say, so I held out my hand. What an idiot, little girls don't shake hands, but this one did. She put her chubby little hand in mine. I could see the baby dimples on her knuckles. Hi, Kane, she said. Hello, McKenna, I said. Great, wasn't it? I've never really known what to say with kids. Most topics of conversation with adults are just off limits. So, where do you work? I asked her. She giggled. Now that was to die for. I wanted her to do it again. I'm not working, silly, she said. She had the sweetest voice imaginable. It was low and a little breathy, a little husky. I figured that when she grew up, she'd look a lot like Ripley. I'm too small to work. How old are you? I asked. She held up three perfect little fingers. Three, she said. Wow, that's the perfect age. You're a very pretty girl, did you know that? She blinked those impossibly huge blue eyes. Yeah, I know, she said. We both laughed. I raised my eyes to Ripley. She watched us with a strange expression on her face. That's a big gun, she said. What the, what are you talking about, Ripley? I asked. Look at her, she said. Look at her. I looked. She was gorgeous. I still didn't understand what Ripley was talking about. She said, Kane, can I swim in your pool? McKenna nodded. Right now, she nodded. Your dress is going to get wet, honey, Ripley said. Take it off, suggested McKenna, hopefully. Ripley looked at me. What the hell? I shrugged my shoulders. Okay, sweetie, she said. I'll stay here and talk to Kane. Damn, now I was stuck. McKenna, see the black three painted on the side of the pool? I asked. She looked up. What three? She asked. I took one of those chubby little palms and traced the number on my palm. Looks like this, she nodded. Yes, I see. Don't pass it by, I said. Okay, she said. Why? It's too deep for you in there, I told her. She nodded again, took off her shoes, pulled her little white dress over her head, and handed it to Ripley. Hold this, mommy, she said. She ran to the steps, adjusted her panties with a giggle, and splashed water. In seconds, I froze. She called Ripley Mommy. When I could think again, Ripley sank into the shower lounge next to mine, holding a beer in one hand and a slice of my pizza in the other. What the hell are you doing? I said. Do you like her? She asked. She's pretty, isn't she, and very sweet. 
I know you'll love her. See, I hesitated for a moment. Yes, she's gorgeous. Mom, is she yours? Ripley, when did this happen? Well, three years ago, of course, she laughed. Yes, she's mine, see. She can be yours too, if you're interested. My brain was very stupid. What does this mean? What's going on here, Ripley? Why did you bring her here? Why are you here? You left me, remember? You needed to find yourself. Why can't you leave me alone? She laughed again. Which one do you want me to answer first? How about this one? I brought her here so she could meet her father. I've been trying to do that for three years now, but you're too big a coward to meet me face to face so I can introduce you. If you hadn't run away from the cellar, you would have seen Kelly drop her off. I started to panic. Her father? I'm not, what do the damn you, Ripley? I'm not a coward. Can't you get it into your head that I don't want to be around you? I think it's time for you to go. I'm not leaving, she said. You'll have to call the police to get rid of me. Do you really want to get rid of her? She nodded toward the pool. You're her father, Cain. Look at her. Don't you feel that? This little wet beauty had found some pool toys and was happily playing with them. I better get her some towels, I said. There was a huge lump in my throat, and I felt myself starting to lose the self-control I so desperately needed around Ripley. I got up and went into the house and grabbed some big fluffy towels. Atlas looked at me sleepily, got to his feet, and followed me out. He saw Ripley, and his stumpy tail started wagging furiously. Then he spotted McKenna and started wagging his whole body. He trotted over to Ripley, and she hugged him. Here comes Mommy's big guy, she purred. He licked her face, his huge pink tongue almost covering it. She looked up at me, drool dripping from her chin, and laughed. Is one of those towels for me? I couldn't help but grin. All Mastiffs drool, Neapolitans drool the most. Atlas is a 160-pound male Neapolitan Mastiff. I bought him as a puppy when Ripley and I were still married. Yeah, she said. Mommy really loves you. She misses you a lot. It ruined my mood. I remembered that she was the one who left. If she missed him so much, she must have known. The cure, McKenna saw him and shrieked with delight. She jumped up on the pool steps, and I wrapped her in one of the towels. Is that Atlas? she asked. Mommy told me about him. Can I pet him? Yeah, he'll love it, I told her. She tiptoed over to him and her mother and put her arms around his neck. He was panting with pleasure, all that loose wrinkled skin twitching with the effort. She looked at her mother. I want him, Mom, she said. Ripley looked at me and raised an eyebrow. She wiped McKenna dry, threw a dress over her head, and watched her run off, throwing Atlas a ball to chase after her. I don't believe you, I told her. Yes, I do, she replied. I'll find proof. I'll do a DNA test. I've never been unfaithful to you, see. You know that. I didn't know that at all, but it didn't matter. I need to see that proof, I told her. That's what I thought you'd say. You're going to have to cooperate. I'm going to need a cheek swab. I would have done it a long time ago if you hadn't run away every time I tried to talk to you. I was beginning to lose hope of ever seeing you again. You were very good at hiding, Ripley. You left me, remember? I said. You weren't happy. That's what you told me. We got married too soon. You had your whole life ahead of you, and you wanted to explore it. That's what you said, and that's what you did. You tore my heart out. I loved you with everything I had, but that wasn't enough for you. You wanted more. I don't know what the hell you wanted. All I know is that you moved out, went on your merry way exploring, or whatever. Fine, you had every right to do whatever you wanted. It's been three years. Why are you here? Don't talk nonsense to me, Kane. Did I divorce you? she asked. 
No, you just left me, I said. That's right, she said. You divorced me, not the other way around. What did you expect? I asked. Not that, she said. What makes you think I didn't mean exactly what I said, Kane? Well, I saw you at the White Rhino with Big Dog, I said. He has dark hair and blue eyes, doesn't he? You bastard, she practically spat out. And so are you. Charles is a colleague of ours. We performed there, and he's the biggest on the planet. What did you think? I'd ever voluntarily end up with him anywhere? I thought you were having a good time, I said. I'm an artist, she growled. This was the Ripley I remembered. Well, how's the search going? I asked. Have you found yourself? God, you really can be an asshole sometimes, Kane. She took a deep breath. I didn't come here to fight with you. Quite the opposite. I need to explain some things to you. I don't want to hear it, I said. Well, that's too bad, she replied. You have a daughter, Kane. I'm her mother. She's our daughter, and you need to listen to me. She needs a father in her life. Maybe the big dog would be interested in hearing your story, I said. She sighed. Kane, there are things you need to know. I never meant for things to turn out the way they did. I never meant to hurt you like this. I was 24 years old, for God's sake. We got married when we were 19. I felt like I was suffocating. I wasn't going to leave you, I just needed some time alone. I tried to explain, but I'm afraid I didn't do a very good job. You went nuclear and divorced me. You moved to Alaska, for God's sake. Alaska, Kane, really? Is that the place you thought would be the furthest away from me? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did, I said. You moved out, left me. We talked about starting a family, and then in one month, it all went to. You walked away, your choice. Yes, I moved out, she said. I was scared. I was losing myself. The thought of having a baby was scaring me to death. I just panicked. I know that sounds like a load of crap to you. It does to me too now that I'm not a stupid, immature kid. I felt like there was no me, there was just U.S., and I felt like I was losing my identity. I panicked, and I got stupid. You know I never wanted to leave you. I just needed some space, some time to realize who Ripley really was and what she was. I thought I'd see you every week, make love to you, that it would be like when we were dating. I wasn't going to leave you, Kane. I didn't want another man. I wanted us to stay exclusive. But you were too busy yelling at me to realize that I was just trying to establish myself as an independent person. I thought a few months would pass, and I'd move back in with you. I loved you, Kane. I still love you. You hurt me a lot when you went crazy like that. I know I hurt you too, and I need to tell you how sorry I am for that. I'm sorry, Kane. I messed up. I didn't mean to do it, but I did it. I remembered our last conversation. I was yelling, angry, and upset. She had told me she was moving the week before, and all week, the anger, resentment, and insecurity had been building up inside of me. When she pulled up in her truck, and I realized she was really leaving, it all spilled out. It wasn't nice, and that was the last time I talked to her. Oh, she tried. I just wasn't in the right state of mind to have anything to do with her. I wasn't in the right state of mind that day either. What do you want from me, Ripley? I asked. Is everything all right, Ripley? I don't believe a word you say. You realize that, don't you? I said. I think you've been searching for your identity, sleeping around town. I don't know what your game is here, but I think you'd better leave. She let out an intermittent sigh. I expected all of this, Kane. It doesn't make it any easier, but I really expected you to feel this way. You never gave me a chance to explain what was going on. You didn't show up for court, you avoid me like the plague, and you run away every time I look for you. You know the court ordered counseling, don't you? The problem was that you were in Alaska and couldn't be reached. 
In the end, I just gave up and let it go. Give me a chance, that's all I ask. Let me come and talk to you. Let us come and talk to you. If not for me, then for her. She nodded toward McKenna, who was walking toward us, leaning on Atlas's broad back. What about her, Kane? I couldn't say anything because McKenna was standing next to me. I love Atlas, she said. Kane, when you become my daddy, will I be able to stay here and play with him sometimes? It wasn't fair. There was no way in the world it was fair. It got worse when she climbed into my lap and put her curly head on my chest. Hold me, she said. She curled up as if making herself comfortable. I have a couple of errands to run, Ripley said. It'll only take me a couple of hours. McKenna seems to want to sleep. Can she stay with you? No, I said. That gorgeous little face leaned toward me, and the sleepy blue eyes melted my soul. Please, Kane, Mom's doing boring stuff, and I'm really tired. Well, let's go inside, I said. I carried her, and she was light as a feather. Ripley carried the rest of the pizza in the fridge. I sat down on the couch, and McKenna curled up in my lap. It's cold, she complained. I grabbed the plaid from the back of the couch and covered her. She wriggled until she was comfortable, her breathing slow and deep. I could hear Ripley fiddling around in the kitchen, transferring the pizza to the Tupperware and then to the refrigerator. She brought me a beer and opened it, setting it on the table so I could reach it. Damn woman, she waltzed into my house and made herself at home like she had every right to be here. And she got away with it because she knew McKenna would get me around quickly. She looked at us for a long time, and I saw tears glisten in her eyes. I hadn't expected that green spark. It sparkled in them, and she turned, picked up her purse, and headed for the door. I won't be long, she said over her shoulder. Her voice sounded strange, and I saw her wipe her eyes as she closed the door. I watched sports on TV and drank beer. Every now and then, McKenna would sigh softly in her sleep, and then Ripley would kneel down in front of us and watch us. I woke up a little, and McKenna was still asleep. Ripley noticed that I was awake and reached out and cupped my cheek with the palm of her hand. Take her to the car, Kane, she said. I carefully stood up, trying not to disturb my weary cargo, and carried her outside. Ripley opened the back door of her Escalade, and I carefully placed McKenna in her car seat. There was a small pillow on the seat next to her, and I used it to prop her head up. I couldn't help myself, I kissed her tiny cheek. She sighed and shifted slightly to a more comfortable position. I stood up, and Ripley took a step toward me, snuggling up to me with all her hotness, and kissed my cheek. Thank you, Kane, she said. Can we come over sometime tonight when you get home from work? I really need to talk to you. I'll bring the stuff for the DNA test. I'll bring it, please. Friday at 6. I told her I'll cook, not trusting myself any longer. I squeezed past her and walked into the house without looking back. I stood with my back against the closed door for a minute, then shook my head to chase away the cobwebs. It had been a hell of a night. For the rest of the week, I was useless at work. My mind kept replaying the sensations I had felt sitting on the couch and holding the little angel in my lap. Visions of an incredibly sexy and passionate red-haired girl filled my dreams at night, and I woke up exhausted. Something was also bothering me, something Ripley had said that I couldn't remember, but it was important. On Thursday, it finally got to me. She said that if I had stayed in the basement, I would have seen my mom drop off McKenna. What the hell? I visited my parents regularly, and they never said a word about Ripley or the girl. About Ripley, I knew I'd made it clear I didn't want to talk about her, and the little girl who could be mine, the one they were babysitting, that was a whole other story. That night, I invited myself over to my parents' house for dinner, uttering the four famous words, we need to talk. I was still upset when I got to the house, but dinner and talking about other things calmed me down enough to listen. Mom said they hadn't told me about McKenna because they didn't want it to look like they were pushing me to get back together with Ripley. Well, that was fair enough, I guess. I didn't want to talk about her before. 
They seem to have been in touch with her, I mean, Ripley, from the beginning. She told them the same nonsense she told me, that she'd found herself and decided she could succeed on her own. It didn't make sense to me. Anyway, her career was completely her own, and she was doing just fine. Besides, shouldn't married people do everything together? I still thought the real reason was that she wanted to try things out with someone else, or more than one, before we had kids. That was the only reason that made sense to me, and that's what I said. I don't think that's the point, Mom said. I know what she said is crazy, but I think she was really sincere. She thought you'd just live apart for a few months, and then she'd move back in. She had every intention of being faithful to you, and as far as we know, she was until the divorce became final. You mean you two are buying into this nonsense? No, son, we didn't, Dad said. We told her it was the stupidest thing we'd ever heard of when she came to us in tears because you left. We asked her what she expected after a stunt like that, you know? She said she expected you to be upset for a while, but then calm down and wait for her to come back. By the time we were done talking to her, she realized she'd screwed up big time. But none of us knew what to do to fix it. We didn't even know where you were. We didn't have the heart to tell her to go away. We tried to help her clean up. I don't know how successful, then mom picked up, then she told us she was pregnant. She swore the baby was yours, but we didn't quite believe her. Nevertheless, we tried to help her prepare to be a responsible mom. She did really well, Kane. She went from a flighty princess who could act on any silly idea that came into her head to a responsible adult capable of raising a child. Did you know that after McKenna was born, she cut her radio time down to half and gave up performing on the street almost entirely? I didn't know that, Kane. I know how much you loved Ripley, and I understand how hurt you were when she left. I don't blame you for what you did, Dad put in. Ripley was completely selfish and incredibly stupid when she left you, but she's not the same girl anymore. Mom and I see a lot of good in her, especially when she's with McKenna. I think it's in your best interest to give her a chance to show you how she's changed. If you don't, and she decides you never will, she won't be available for long. I didn't think it was necessary to explain to my parents that Ripley was, by her own admission, an artist. She was good at fooling people. On the other hand, my parents were pretty good judges of character. Stupidity is one thing, and lying is quite another, and they were sure she was just stupid. At least she was consistent. She told them the same thing she told me. I had some things to think about, so I took Friday off to go fishing. I have always found the process of finding the perfect place to land a fly heartbreaking. I'm alone in my head, just the sound of running water, the motion of the rod and line working together to make the perfect cast. I caught two big rainbows and one brown and felt so much better. I may have even been confident enough to tackle Ripley and McKenna. I stopped by to pick up shrimp and ingredients to make shrimp Alfredo linguine. I steamed vegetables, made a salad, and opened a bottle of wine. I had apple juice for McKenna and hoped she would like it. I hated the thought of opening myself up to Ripley again. I was still feeling the pain and rage from last time, and now I was letting her open the cracks again. I almost threw away dinner. The pot of pasta was in my hands, but I put it back on the stove. I thought about just leaving and not being present when they showed up. On the other hand, maybe the parents were right, and I had misjudged her act. I saw Atlas lift his head, and those little ears flicked back and forth. He stood up with a groan and went into the living room. That usually means he can hear the car outside. So, I combined the Alfredo sauce, pasta, and shrimp, and stirred it all together. There was still Parmesan cheese left to add, but I'll do that right before I put the dish on the table. The doorbell rang, and I went to answer it. They stood like that. McKenna hid behind Ripley again, but when she saw Atlas, she jumped forward and hugged him. He never liked it when I hugged him, but he didn't seem to mind her hug. What's more, he was squirming all over. She was even more adorable than the last time I'd seen her. She was wearing a beautiful red dress, and her curly hair framed her face like a halo. Ripley, just Ripley, she was wearing a dark green dress, and she was stunning. 
She's tall and slender, but with curves in all the right places. Her waist is long, slim, and firm. Her hips widen dramatically, and she has the roundest, firmest ass imaginable. My gaze slid down to her breasts, which made my heart sink. They were exposed and showed a small cleavage. There was a gold chain that was attached to a small jade dagger that I had given her for her 18th birthday. My gaze slid to her face. It was heart-shaped with high cheekbones, a thin patrician nose with a scattering of freckles, huge emerald eyes, and plump red lips curved into a smile. She had a cream pie in her hands. Hey, Kane, did we pass the inspection? She laughed, and I felt the old excitement sweep over me. Uh, I cleared my throat. Yeah, you two would have stopped the train. Come on in. I stepped aside, and she walked to the kitchen and put the pie in the fridge. She looked right at home. I sank to the floor in front of McKenna. Hi, honey, I said. I tried to make my voice as gentle as possible. Did you have a good day? I asked. She stopped hugging Atlas, took a step toward me, and put her arms around my neck. I felt her soft little cheek pressed against mine. She pulled away and looked me in the face. Hi, Kane, she said. Yeah, I went to kindergarten and they took us to something. What's it called, Mom? She turned to Ripley. Science Center, Ripley said, coming back into the living room to see us. Yeah, we were taken there, McKenna said. I liked it. What did you do? I went fishing, I told her. You like fishing? I don't know, she said, shrugging. My mom never took me fishing. Well, we'll have to fix that, I said. Would you like to go fishing with me and Atlas? Yes, she said. Do we go? We have to work that out with your mom, I said. Are you hungry? Yes, I'm hungry, she said. Mommy made a pie. I saw, I said. I picked her up in my arms and carried her into the dining room. That's where the problem arose. My chairs were too low. I went and bought some cushions for her to sit on, and everything was fine. Is there anything I can do? asked Ripley. Pour the drinks, I said. We're ready. I put the cheese in and stirred it until it melted, took everything to the table, and by the time I was done, Ripley had had her drinks, and we sat down to dinner. McKenna chatted cheerfully the whole time and didn't make us feel uncomfortable. While we were busy with her, she seemed to enjoy my culinary efforts and asked for more pasta. She ate it all, even the vegetables, and we all had a piece of cake each. It was chocolatey and very tasty. Ripley learned a few new skills. When we were married, she used to set toast on fire, so most of the cooking was done by me. After pie, we went into the living room and Ripley put on a cartoon for McKenna. We sat on the couch. McKenna snuggled up against me on one side and Ripley took off her shoes and tucked her legs under her in that impossible way that women do. That was delightful, she said. You didn't lose your touch in the kitchen. Thank you, I said. Ripley, I don't mean to spoil the mood, but what exactly are you doing? I'm throwing my hat in the ring again, she said. I've been trying to explain myself to you for a long time. I came to sit and talk to you three days after I moved out. You were gone. You disappeared. When I found out you were back, I tried to talk to you. I don't know your phone number, so I couldn't call you. You blocked me, so I couldn't email you. I must have sat outside your office a hundred times when I found out where you worked. I don't know how you did it, but you never came out. I asked the guard to tell me when you were there. I said I went out the other door. She smiled sadly. I figured it must be something like this. I drove here and parked on the next street over. Sometimes I'd see you leave, but I could never tell if you were home. You never came home while I was here. I always checked. I told her if I saw your car, I just went somewhere else. That's why I didn't get a chance to tell you about McKenna, she said. You were gone the whole time I was pregnant. I brought a test kit. Came just leave it when you leave, I told her. 
Assuming you're telling me the truth now, what? I need my husband, she said. McKenna needs her father. What the hell, said I, you drop a bomb into my life, go away, give me some psychological mumbo jumbo, come back, drop another bomb, and say you needed me. Well, I needed you, Ripley. You didn't. Yes, I glanced at McKenna. She was engrossed in her movie. You didn't care at all that I needed you. Why should I care about you needing me? You're wrong, she said. Okay, tell me where I'm wrong. I said, looking at McKenna. She was still engrossed in her movie. I wasn't big enough for you. I didn't do it for you, Ripley looked horrified. Oh no, Kane. Don't ever think that. It's never been a problem for us, you know that. No, you've rocked my world, you're huge, I've never. Jesus, Ken, what is wrong with you? You're such a man. Why do men think that? Do you think every woman is a size queen? Are you a queen, mommy? Piped up McKenna. Damn, she was listening. Ripley laughed. No, baby, but you're a princess, McKenna giggled. Great rescue, I thought. I reached down and squeezed her knee. She smiled at me, and my vision blurred. I want her, Ripley, I said. What do you mean? She asked. I mean, I want to be with her. I want her to stay with me. I want her to come for the weekend. I want her to come for Christmas. Okay, that's what I thought you'd think, she said. I know how you feel. The problem is, I want her too. We can work things out. I want her to stay the night, I said. You and I are kind of one and the same, Kay, she said. McKenna, would you like to spend the night with me and Atlas? I asked. Yes, her little curly head bobbed. Baby, do you want to stay with just C and Atlas? She asked. This time she shook her head. No, she said, she was very adamant. I want you to stay too, Mom. I might need you. You just don't have to think about yourself, Ripley said. She's more important. You have to think about what she'd want too. I'll work with you, and you can have her almost any time you want her, but you have to consider her needs too, that made sense, and I nodded. It didn't sound like the old Ripley either. I get it. That's not what I wanted to talk to you about, she said. See, I need to ask you something. When I told you what was happening to me, I was 100% honest with you. It had nothing to do with what it was about. The idea that you're not big enough is ridiculous. Ripley was almost hysterical. This is too much, she gasped. Anyway, that wasn't the point, Kane. The point was that I wasn't a very mature person. I was so in love with you, and I still am. I felt like I was going to be swallowed up, and nothing would be left of me, and it scared the hell out of me. I panicked, and I did something stupid. You know... I thought I needed to get away from you for a while. I didn't want it to be forever. I thought we'd see each other a couple of times a week, and I... She looked at McKenna and giggled. I'll knock your socks off. I know this all sounds like I think it does now, but it wasn't like that at the time. I was an immature child, and I thought like one. Why didn't you say so? I asked. It seemed to me that you wanted it to be forever. That's what I said, she insisted. That's exactly what I said. But either I didn't say it very well, or you weren't listening very well. Did I ever say, I'm leaving you, see? I don't want to be married to you anymore? No, you said, Cain, I don't know how to say this, but I'm moving. I have an apartment on Pine Street, and I'm moving there next Saturday. I need to be alone, I need to find my own identity, or some stupid age like that. My voice got a little louder, and McKenna looked up at me. It's okay, I'm sorry, I said. Her eyes went back to the TV, but I knew her ears were fixed on Ripley and me. It wasn't working, this is too awkward, Ripley said. I want you to be able to say what you want to say. Are you doing anything tomorrow? She asked. I was going to watch a basketball game, have a beer, and wash and vacuum the car, I said. Why can't I come get you and take you somewhere, she asked. 
I'll have my mom watch McKenna. I want to tell you something. I want you to be able to tell me everything. Will you do that for me, Kane? I was very suspicious. Where are you taking me? I asked. Jesus, Kane, stop being such a weak, she said. You think I'm dangerous. You think I'm plotting to take you down and throw your body in the lake. Yes and no, I said. I don't think you're planning to kill me, but I think you're dangerous. You're the most dangerous person I've ever met, she laughed. Please, I'll be here at 10. Then I'll help you wash the car, okay? The credits of McKenna's movie were running. Okay, I said, don't get your hopes up, Ripley. I won't, she promised. I played with McKenna and Atlas for a while, and it was time for them to go home. McKenna gave me a big hug, and Ripley gave me a hug and a kiss on the cheek. I buckled McKenna in her car seat. When shall we spend the night at your place, she asked, and when will you take me fishing? She had a memory like a steel trap. Do you have a date for Sunday? I asked her. She giggled. No, I don't go on dates. Why do you want to know? If it's okay with your mom, I'll take you fishing with me on Sunday, I said. We'll need to discuss when you can stay the night. Okay, she said. She nodded vigorously, and her curls bounced. But I really want to stay the night. Can Atlas sleep with me? I don't let him climb on the beds, I told her. He's getting stinky. We can bring his bed into your room, and he'll sleep on the floor next to your bed. She thought about it for a moment. Okay, she said. Ripley, can she go fishing? I asked. Sure, she said. I'll see you at ten. That night, I had nightmares. A little dark-haired girl was being eaten by a giant fish, and I was running to save her. I ran in molasses, and it took me forever to get where I was going. I jumped to my feet, my heart pounding. I was sweating profusely, and it was already four in the morning. I got up and wiped myself with a towel, adrenaline bubbling in my veins. I lay down again. It took a while to get the image out of my head, but the next thing I knew, it was nine, and the alarm on my phone was ringing. I got up took a quick shower, got dressed, and ate my muffin. I was on my second cup of coffee when Atlas got up and went to the door. Just then, the bell rang, and Ripley appeared on the doorstep. Would you like a cup of coffee? I asked. There's one left. I don't want to throw it away. Do you have a takeaway cup? She asked. I'd like to get started. I rummaged around and found two. I poured one for myself and then put mine in the other. Can Atlas go? I asked. Sure, she said. Could you bring him a blanket or something? We'll have two cars to clean if you don't. I grabbed an old blanket I had used in the car and we followed her out. One thing we've always had in common is a love of cars. She wasn't driving the Escalade that day. It must have been just her car. I was impressed. It was silver, and I knew it was a Mercedes, but nothing more. What is it? I asked. It's a 2003 CL Coupe, she said, twin-turbo engine, Kane's 830 pounds per foot of tour. Can I drive? I asked. She laughed. Hell no. When you let me drive the 442, I'll let you drive this one. Okay, you can go, I said. She tilted her head and raised an eyebrow. Yeah, well, like I really trust you. You've never let me drive a car. I'll let you drive, and you'll say no. I know you. She opened the door and spread a blanket on the back seat. She stepped aside, and Atlas slowly climbed in. He was already out of breath, and two white strands dangled from his cheek. She wiped them away with the corner of the blanket. She started the car and turned the air temperature on high. It didn't matter, he always choked in the car. We drove for about 30 minutes, and I knew where we were going. Hey, you're really going to kill me and throw my body in the lake, I said. Atlas will bite you if you hurt me. No, a puppy would never bite. Mommy, would it? She cooed. He panted happily. 
It was cold in the car. I could feel frost forming on my mustache. I looked over at Ripley. Her nipples were trying to tear holes in her shirt. She saw me, looked down, and giggled. Kind of cold, isn't it? You wanted to bring him, she said. I didn't mind looking at those little buttons at all, but I wasn't going to let her know that. I just hummed and looked away. I looked again after a minute when I decided she wasn't looking. We pulled up to the marina, and she parked and opened the trunk. I got out of the car and let Atlas out. I buckled his leash. Most people get a little spooked when they see a 160 pounds beast walking toward them if he's not on a leash. Ripley pulled a large basket and a cooler out of the trunk. I took hold of one handle of the cooler, and she carried the basket. We walked down to the dock, and she nodded to the left. We walked about 50 feet, and she pointed to a beautiful cabin cruiser tied up there. Here it is, she said. We climbed aboard and helped Atlas up. The workmen took the lines off, and Ripley idled us out of the no-go zone and then pressed the gas pedal again, and the big boat took off. It traveled about five miles across the lake and stopped in a cove. Tie us to that tree over there, she said. She shut off the engines, and I tied us up. Whose boat is this? I asked. It's mine, she said. I've had him for about six months now. You're not doing badly, are you? She said. I signed a pretty big contract, she said. That's my signing bonus. Jesus, Ripley, you run with the big boys, I said. Want a beer? She asked. I took one, and we moved to the front deck. We sat facing each other on the cushions, and I realized that the hard knocks were about to begin. Okay, I'll give you this, she said. You may not like it, but if you listen to me, I'll listen to you. Deal? Do you expect me to just sit here? I asked. No, I'd like that, but I'm not looking forward to it, she said. I snorted. She leaned back on the pillow and stretched out her impossibly long legs. Kane, I love you, she said. I've loved you since our first date. I never have and I don't think I ever will. You're the only man I've ever loved. You're the only one for me. When I came to you and told you I needed to get away for a while, I didn't mean forever. I didn't even think about another man. I was still in love with you as much as I was before. I thought I loved you too much. I was wrong. I didn't know it then, but I was. Was I hate to say it, Ripley, I said, but it sounds like buyer's remorse. It sounds like you went out and bought what you wanted, and it didn't turn out the way you thought it would. No, you're wrong, she said. I regret how I did it, not that I did it. I grew up, Kane. I was a stupid, callous girl. Now I'm a woman. I did what I had to do, and if you hadn't run away the way you did, it would have been a lot easier on both of us. I'm not sure that was a bad thing, I said. You're not sure it was bad? It was definitely bad for me, I can tell you that. Are you telling me you don't regret leaving me? I wasn't going to leave you, see, I continued. I moved away, it's not the same. That's, she paused, but have it your way. You had something to do, and instead of trying to work it out together, you just moved out. And now you're telling me that everything would have been fine if I just sat home alone and waited for you to decide to come back to me? I didn't say I was smart, Kane, and I've already told you that I'm sorry for hurting you so much. But I can't regret it because while I was gone, I grew up. When I found out I was pregnant, I had to grow up right away. When did you find out? I asked. Not for a while, she said. I didn't really think about the fact that I wasn't getting my period. The first thing I noticed was a slight nausea in the morning. I just thought I was glitching. It wouldn't go away, so I went to the doctor. That's when I found out I was nine weeks pregnant. Did you know she was mine? I asked Kane. I never had any doubts, she said. You're the only man I've ever let touch me in an intimate way, from the moment we started dating until the day our divorce became final. Couldn't you have waited for the ink to dry? I asked. She looked at me, angry, her eyes flashed. No, 
and I never touched anyone until McKenna was born, she said. I thought she was playing games. What are you saying, Ripley? I asked. I'm just telling you that there was and is no doubt about who McKenna's father is, she said. Okay, we can stop there for now, I said. Okay, go ahead, I said. I'll try not to say anything unless I have a question, she nodded. Kane, I wasn't going to leave you. I wanted to be your wife. I haven't wanted anything else since our first date. I just wanted a chance to see if I could make it on my own. We'd been together since the second semester of freshman year. I lived with my parents, lived in the dorm for one semester, and then moved in with you, Ripley said. This is pointless, Ripley. You've already been successful on your own. You were a celebrity by the time you were 21, and it wasn't like you were part of a team or anything. It was just you, she thought for a moment. Yeah, I guess that's the way it is. Kane, the Ripley O'Keefe that everyone thinks they know doesn't really exist. It's a character I made up, and I'm very good at playing her. She has a lot in common with me, but she's not me. I think a lot of artists are like that. My career, all this stuff, she circled her hand around the cabin of the cruiser, it's her. It's not really me. When I appeared in public, people always expected to meet her, not me. I started to wonder if I really existed, you know? It's not like I've never lived on my own. I wasn't much different, I told her. Yeah, I know that, she said. The difference is that I thought you'd be fine without me. I didn't know how I would live if I didn't have you. I had to learn to trust myself. It had nothing to do with you or us, it was me. I needed to believe in myself that I could stand on my own two feet. I blew it. I'm really, really sorry. I never meant for anything to happen. I didn't realize how upset you were. I didn't realize how I was affecting you and hurting you. I knew you didn't like the idea, but I had to try it myself. I was young and stupid. I realized how stupid I was when you left. Well, it sounded like psychobabble to me, I said. I felt like you were telling me that I wasn't enough for you, that you were looking for an upgrade, and that I wasn't what you needed. No, no, it wasn't like that at all, tears stood in her impossibly huge eyes. I needed you more than ever. I needed you to be there for me, to help me realize that I was an independent person. I just needed to find the right words to tell you how much I loved you and that I wouldn't leave you, that you hadn't done anything wrong, that it was about me. But when I pulled myself together three days later, you were gone. I thought you wanted me to leave, I said. No, she knelt on the floor in front of me and took my hands. I never wanted this, God, Cain. I looked everywhere for you. I called everyone I knew. I came home and cried, God, I cried so hard. Your parents didn't know where you were. You quit your job, you just disappeared. I didn't go to work for two weeks. I was thinking about you every minute, looking for you, trying to track you down, and then I got the divorce papers in the mail. I thought that's what you wanted, I repeated. Well, you were wrong, she said. That's when I found out you were in Alaska, your lawyer told me. I went to the court and asked for counseling. The judge agreed, but there was no way to get you here. I could have explained everything, and then I found out I was pregnant. What did you do? I asked. I was torn apart, she says. I was wondering how this could have happened. I was on the pill, for God's sake. You were the only man who had ever made love to me. I knew it was our baby, but I messed it up so bad. I didn't know what to do. I went to your mom and dad. I told them everything. I told them how stupid I was. They agreed with me, I could see that, but they never once said a bad word to me, she said. They took care of me for a whole week, I stayed with them. You have great parents, Kane. They went to childbirth classes with me, took me to doctor's appointments. Your mom was in the room with me when McKenna was born. She was the first person to hold her in her arms. I'm not even sure they believe she was ours, but they were my support. I sat there, trying to comprehend all of this. I didn't know what to think or what to do.